Hi everyone, today's video is about Annie's Spectacle Themes, the theme of morality in five quick quotes. My name is Zoe Sophie, this is my YouTube Pass English GCSE channel. I'm an English teacher who's been teaching this text for many years and have helped many students to navigate it and write essays that have done very well. So, before we go into morality, as a reminder, and I looked at this last week in a lot of detail on my last video if you haven't already seen it yet please check it out the video is all about how to check your exam board specification for the english gcse so you need to know your exam board and you need to be able to use that to work out the assessment objectives the aos that are required to be focused upon for your essay answers and that will differ depending on whether you're with aqa ed excel ocr so you ought to whichever exam board it is covering the text you need to look find it on the specification document and see the aos if, moving on then to morality when you start your essays on this you need to go in with an idea of what morality actually stands for and what it is so definition principles concerning the distinction between right and wrong or good and bad behavior so it's a system of values it's ideas for how one should behave principles of conduct and obviously this links very closely to the idea of responsibility which is also a theme in this play if you haven't seen my video on responsibility Please check it out because a lot of the quotes that I cite in there can also be used for this question. There's a little bit of an overlap between morality and responsibility. However, a student had this question and asked me, how would I answer it? Which quotes should I use? Hence the video today. But you need an idea of what morality is all about, how it is judged. I think it's looked at from a very objective standpoint. So it's quite black and white. It's quite absolute in its thinking. This is, of course, Priestley himself and his views about right and wrong in society. We know he wrote it in 1945, but it's set in 1912. If you need a reminder about the context of the play, I covered this already. It's in this playlist. Please check it out. That will help you to get an idea of Priestley's agenda and it makes sense as to why this then would be a key theme in the play. So moving on to quote number one, I picked this from the opening stage directions. You'll have seen these before, you'll have seen them annotated in my, what is the video on act one, where I annotate the opening stage directions. This is taken from those and obviously I have cut out a bit with the ellipsis here. But I chose to focus on Edna who is really defined by her role and I've said this before in the Edna video which is also available if you ever get a question on her. And I was looking at what she was doing. She's clearing the table which has no cloth of dessert plates, champagne glasses, decanter of port, cigar box and cigarettes. And I've talked about this before and these items being sort of symbolic for wealth. You're going to say, well, what's that got to do with morality? Well, this idea, you could link it back to the fact that there are poor people and these, this family have all this luxury. This connotes luxury. When you've got some people that are really, really poor. So is it immoral to be, I mean, this, this is a political question almost, but I mean, Priestley was political. Is it immoral to be so privileged when other people have nothing? That could be a link to morality. And then if you look at the contrast, Sybil Burling is about 50, a rather cold woman. So you've got the adjective cold, which makes her seem unfriendly, unkind, not a warm, loving person. And she's her husband's social superior. Now this also ties in with class. But we start to wonder, we've got Edna doing all the work, dealing with all this wealth. And then we've got this very cold woman doing nothing. So again, can you link it to morality? The opening stage directions are really powerful because they set us up for the play. If you need to focus on context for this essay, look at my context video and then make the connections between that and this quote because there's quite a lot of luxury here and there's quite a lot of idle sitting around and then you've got the parlor maid doing everything. Now that is her role, that's what she's paid for, but there's this contrast here which I wanted you to be aware of for quote number one. 
Pro number two. This is still in act one. Arthur Burling giving us the port, Edna. That's right. He pushes it towards Eric. You ought to like this port, Gerald. As a matter of fact, Finchley told me it's exactly the same port your father gets from him. I picked this quote for lots of different reasons. In the Edna video, I pointed this out. He asks her a question and then he answers for her. So, you know, there's something about him that's bordering on rude. Certainly by our standards, he would be. He is excessively confident. Now it's quite strange that he pushes it towards his son, but then he's addressing Gerald. Finchley told me, this is obviously some go-between. It's the same port your father gets from him. Really, I picked this out because it seems that Arthur Burling is trying to get Gerald on side, so to speak. He's being sort of a bit sycophantic here. Sycophantic. A sycophant is a suck-up. So there's something a bit sycophantic here, and it's all to do with class. Gerald Croft is upper class. Arthur Burling is middle class, linked to morality. You've got this behaviour that almost seems borderline inappropriate. There's a line between making your guests comfortable and being a little bit nauseating, a little bit overwhelming. An audience might see through this. He's had to go to a third party to ask him, what do the Crofts get? and then to buy it in. Some people think that's a lovely thing to do, but when we combine that with everything else you know about Mr. Burling, we could probably read into the fact that he's focusing all his energy on getting around Gerald and yet other people get nothing. So again, you can link that back to morality. You can also link that in with context and the class system. Quote number three, and if you'd really loved me, you couldn't have said that. I got that girl sacked from Millwoods and now you've made up your mind I must obviously be a selfish, vindictive creature. This is Sheila to Gerald in Act 2 towards the end of things when her part has come out in it and it's about to link to sort of his, his reveal as well. Their relationship breaks down. If you don't know what the adjective vindictive means, if someone is described as vindictive, they're bitter and they're cruel. Vindictive people lash out. They're unkind. So selfish and unkind creature. She's used that dehumanising term there. Dehumanising term. She's likened herself more to a monster than a human. There's quite an accusatory tone here. Which arguably, these two are engaged. And especially in the time that it's set, it would have been quite unusual to have such a public display of animosity between these two so you could read into that and link it back to morality clearly Sheila feels that she has behaved in a moral fashion and she's right she's been utterly unkind to a stranger that she need not have done and it costs the stranger a lot and her nothing to be kind or to be mean there was no reason for her really to do it other than her own jealousy so she's been immoral but the language she she uses towards him and if you'd really loved me you couldn't have said that their relationship has broken down so you can look at the morality associated with getting engaged getting married partners supporting each other and the edwardian customs of politeness i mean they were really the sort of next era after the victorians the victorians are very prude and they were very bothered about reputation. In that respect, the Edwardians aren't much different. This setting, all of this would have been quite incendiary, quite explosive in nature. So it can be linked to morality on two counts. Sheila behaving in a moral fashion and their relationship it has broken down and the accusatory tone that she's adopting for him. Quote number four. This is an act three. Kind of near the beginning. Mrs. Burling coming to life. I should think not, Eric. I'm absolutely ashamed of you. Eric, well, I don't blame you, but don't forget I'm ashamed of you as well. Yes, both of you. So you've got this horrible word, exchanged. I'm ashamed of you. You've got the repetition of it. And shame was even more powerful than I think it is now. Again, contextually, they were all about reputation. Context. Reputation matters. And here theirs has fallen apart. It's a good quote actually for the generations as well if you get that as a question, just because you've got younger and older conversing in this accusatory way. I'm absolutely, she uses the intensifier. There's no going back, but don't forget I'm ashamed as you as well. Yes, both of you, this affirmation, mum and dad. So this links to morality, morality of conduct, or should I say lack of morality, immorality. 
They are immoral in how they're behaving. Don't get confused with the word amoral, which means not to have a moral compass. They clearly have a sense of right and wrong and they choose to be selfish, really. Last quote, I tell you, whoever that inspector was, it was anything but a joke. You knew it then, you began to learn something and now you've stopped. You're ready to go on in the same old way. Now this is Sheila. She is the character that changes the most. She is uh, most like the inspector. And we know the inspector is Priestley's mouthpiece, as I've mentioned in my inspector video. Now, she's said the same old way. Now, there's something about her that's almost didactic here. Didactic means to teach, or almost to preach. So it's didactic sort of nature of comments. This links very clearly with morality, because the inspector calls, he examines their morality that's his role and by doing so he finds them wanting every one of them you began to learn something look at the past tense there and now they've not so again this is accusatory too a lot of these quotes are very negative a lot of them are very angry if you wanted to contrast that for an essay you could look at someone like Edna who just gets on and makes the tea she's a very moral woman She's probably the most virtuous character in the play. So if you want to look at morality, don't forget to include those characters who are moral consistently. Edna would be a good example, though she doesn't say much. She is a good example. So this is towards the end. And notice over these five quotes, I'm trying to spread out quotes from beginning, middle and end. So you've got a whole argument throughout the whole of the play, which a lot of examples want you to evidence. To summarise then, morality is a key theme. It's presented similarly to the theme of responsibility. I would say if you're studying, if you're writing an essay for either responsibility or morality, you do well to look at the respective video for each um, because there I've made sure I've included different quotes, albeit they're touching on a very similar idea. So it'd be good for you to watch both. Like responsibility, it's sorely lacking from some characters. It's a matter of scale. Some are more immoral than others. Some repent some feel bad and some do not everything links back to Priestley's moral code and that really is, that moral code is socialism this is a highly political play he was a socialist and he wanted to instruct his audience to be socialist that's why he makes all the capitalists look bad in this morality is applied in an objectivist way a very right and wrong kind of way and it makes sense because it's 1912 setting there weren't so many reasons around things I suppose or unusual family arrangements as maybe there are now people had to get married and have children within marriage for example that was very much a prescribed traditional way of living and if you didn't do that you would judge negatively for that is that the case now no so the morality then is much more objectivist it's much more black and white it's much more right and wrong and that's as much a result of the time as it is Priestley and the way that he writes and the message that he wishes to portray so if your essay plan, as I've talked about this in previous videos you need to define what morality is in your introduction you need to have an opinion on this so this is what I mentioned in last week's video about spe exam specifications and assessment objectives. You need to go, in, particularly for literature, because you've already had an opportunity to read and study the text. You need to go in with an opinion already. You need to have thought about all the characters, all the themes that you can think of and the setting before you go into that exam. So you've got an opinion. And if you haven't got one, you need to watch YouTube and study to try and find an opinion that resonates with you. You could start your introduction. Priestley highlights the importance of morality through. So you're addressing the question in your first sentence. It could be a very technique focused answer for certain exam boards. I'm thinking of AQA, for example. A lot of exam boards will award marks for terminology, AO2. Or if it's more contextual, they're focusing on. So there's lots more marks for context. You want to point out why this is relevant to those in the Edwardian era and to a 1945 audience. But you need to focus on morality. It doesn't have to be a long introduction, but it would make sense if you could do something that would show the examiner your focus on the question then you've got your analytical paragraphs now obviously different exam boards have different marks for the questions you know the six paragraph structure would probably work for a 30 marker if you've only got a 20 marker you might be on three to four paragraphs maybe an introduction conclusion would be something they'd want you to write I think they work very well but it is up to you and your exam board so there's various different 
paragraph structures you can employ. These are just a guide and some YouTubers um, have even said, and teachers, Mr. Sales is one of them, kill P, he doesn't like it. He says those more able students can actually integrate, point and explain. They don't need to separate them all out. So it really is up to you how you do it. This is just a guide. But point and evidence is roughly your AO1 understanding. It's giving your quote, it comes under AO1. Your techniques, terminology, so similes, metaphors, verbs, knowing your word classes, that's AO2 terminology. It's not enough just to be able to say, this is a verb. You need to be able to explain its effect on the audience. And context, so you need to know when this play was set and when it was written. I refer you back again to my context video. If you haven't already watched it, you ought to. And finally, if you've got time or you think that a conclusion is worthy, certainly AQA students and Ed Excels, I have said to um, you before that it's worth just putting a short conclusion in to show the exam you finished and to reaffirm the points and the argument you've made throughout. In conclusion, Priestley presents morality as objective, as a strong governing theme to inspire change in an audience and make them think more like a socialist. Of course, that would assume that you're linking socialism with being moral. Again, that's something if you do that, then you need to explain that in your essay if you're a, a more of a capitalist person writing this then you need to certainly at least focus on that being Priestley's interpretation of it even if it's not your own so make sure that you are linking back to the analytical argument that you've raised out here and when I say an overarching argument I mean that you've set it out in the introduction these kind of agree with it all the way through if you've got a consistent argument or response in relation to the question you've been asked, that's how you're going to get those higher grades, those sixes, sevens, eights and nines. You need to have a consistent argument all the way through. I hope this has helped you. If you've got any questions, please reach out. My website's passenglishgcse.co.uk. If you want to leave a comment, I'd be grateful to see what you think, um, how Priestley presents morality in this play. And if this video was useful, please give it a like, please subscribe and thank you for watching.